All right, church, can you hear me? Okay? Good, good, good. Man, what a pleasure it is to sing with you guys. What a pleasure it is to worship with you. Oh, I, I was so good. Hey, so church, um, if you're new, my name is Shane. I'm pastor here, um, and uh, it's a privilege to serve the saints here. We are in a season of finding out and asking the Lord who we are as a church. We've been seeking the scriptures, and we don't really get to tell God who we are. He tells us who we are and what our mission is. Amen? And we get that in what we've seen in the scriptures, which is the Great Commission. The Great Commission. So our mission here at First Baptist is the Great Commission. The Great Commission. So I want you to say it with me if you remember how we phrase it. Um, this is like the streamlined version of the Great Commission. It means the same thing. We are to go disciple, baptize, and teach in the power and presence of Jesus. We are to go disciple, baptize, and teach in the power and presence of Jesus. That's what we're all about here at First Baptist. And we're going to be more and more walking into that new identity. And the book of Mark has been a part of that journey. We know that we've been in the book of Mark. We're at the end. This is where Jesus is walking into Jerusalem, and he is about to go to war and completely defeat Satan, sin, and death. Yeah, that's worth a, that's worth a hoop. That's, that's worth getting excited about because he was marching into Jerusalem. He was marching to the cross. We saw him just recently as we revisited his death on the cross and why it was important. But today, as I told you, the Sunday that the grave was empty is coming, and it's here. Amen? And so we're going to look at the passage where Jesus overcomes death. And it is going to be a time of showing and telling. So um, I know many of you, before we get into the passage and before we read it, uh, how many of you are already making hunting plans? Some of you know somebody who's making hunting plans because that time is coming, right? Well, uh, I remember as a kid, I was so, so excited to go hunting with my dad for the first time. And I'll never forget... I'll never forget when we went, uh, he got an elk, and I could not wait. So I had seen all the amazing things I got to see hunting with my dad, and I had to bring something back to show my classmates what I had experienced. And I got the bright idea that maybe I should take a limb from the elk to my class. This was in third or fourth grade, and uh, I bagged it up. I didn't even tell my mom. I threw it in my backpack. I was so excited to share with my peers what I had seen and what I had experienced with my dad. And so you can imagine I get to school, and I pop that puppy out, and it's just, it's a hoof. It's like an elk hoof. And I'm like, I remember taking it out of the backpack and going, look what I have done. It wasn't me, it was my dad, but still. And I was so excited to show and tell what I had experienced with my dad. The end of the book of Mark is our opportunity to respond like that. He's about to show in this amazing display our dad, through Christ, walks out of the grave. And now we get to be people who... We've seen the show that God put on. Now we get to tell others about it. Amen? So let's look at the passage then. Let's first behold. Mark 16, 1 says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spice, bought spices. Sorry, excuse me. They bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. That's Jesus. So they're thinking they're going to go and anoint the body of Jesus. By the way, if you remember earlier on in the book of Mark, do you remember Mary Magdalene and what she did? She was the woman who poured out expensive perfume on Jesus, and Jesus turned around and said, she's prepared me for burial. And we talked about, man, what providence. Mary's probably there this day and like, I don't have any money to buy any more spices. You know why? Because I already prepared Jesus for burial. I already poured out this worship on him. So some provenance there. So verse 2, And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. 
Uh, for some of you, this means very early morning. Maybe you haven't seen it before. That's me most of the time. Don't worry. I'm just kidding. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, this is an important aspect of what they did. They looked up and they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. I like this today. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, you can go to something called the Garden Tomb, which is a tomb that they discovered. They theorize that it may be Jesus's, but it was a common tomb at the time. And as you go in, I got to go in with a camera and I got to look in. And in the first chamber, you walk in and there's all of these urns where family families would have uh, been prepared for burial. They would have been, uh, they would have... Um, decomposed a bit, and then they put their bones in these urns. And so the whole rich, wealthy family would have been in that first chamber that they walk into. But as you walked into this tomb with the big stone, you look to the right, and there is a small stone bed, which is where they would have laid Jesus's body. And so they, you can hear as the women, they step into, and it's, it's probably, I'd say, not any bigger than some of your campers if you will. It, it was just a smaller cave. You look in, you look to the right, and what they see is not what they expected to see. They see this white, th this, uh, dre this man dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Verse 6, and he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And verse 8, And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And they were afraid. Brothers and sisters, would you pray with me again? Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that we would be so overcome by awe in what you have done by raising from the grave. Lord, we would pray, place our faith and our joy and that we would tell it, we would shout it from the rooftops. But God, I pray that we would be a people that would do two things, that we would encounter you, we would see the show that you put on, the display that you put on in history by conquering death through Jesus. And that we would go and tell others the good news, the gospel. Lord, we pray that we would be a church that would do that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, as we see, before I get into this, I want to just point out to you that uh, some of you are wondering why I'm ending in the book of Mark. If you see right where we read to, there's a little bracket, that little black bracket in your Bible. And it's bracketed. And it's bracketed all the way at the end of chapter 16. Now, the reason for that is that, as far as we can tell, in the earliest manuscripts of the scriptures that the, the early church had, this, all of those passages were not in the original writing of the scriptures. Okay? Does, does that mean that we should just rip them out in the Bible? No, they're in some of the newer manuscripts. We just think that possibly they were added later. Therefore, um, the, it, some of them actually, I think, were uh, scholars took from the other Gospels and put them in, put them in from stories from the life of Paul into the book. Um, but that last part, it's bracketed in most of your Bibles to acknowledge that it's not in the earliest manuscripts that we have. Manuscripts, by the way, are just mean earliest recordings of the Scriptures that we have. The, the latter part of Mark shows up later. Everybody good? Clear as mud? Okay, come to our, our tough questions class. We're going to actually explore that in, in more depth uh, as to um, why we know what are the earliest manuscripts and uh, textual criticism and what that looks like. But for today, number one, what we see here is that the women coming to see Jesus, they had bought spices, they anticipated seeing Jesus. And for us, when we, in our relationship with God, it's so important to this word, behold God. 
Behold God. See, we don't jump into church and just start asking you to do stuff. There's a danger in church because we become so much about the doing that we forget that God calls us to be sons and daughters of God. And so there's an important aspect. This is why people encourage you that you can't, you can't just do things for God if you're not being with him first. This is the, the vine principle in John 15, 5, where it says uh, that I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me. He says, abide in me. It doesn't say go and change the world for me. He says, abide in me. From that overwhelming place of abiding in Jesus, that's what we work in, okay? So first, the women are coming with this expecta- expectation that they're going to see Jesus, Jesus' body. To start, I want you to uh, just think on what does it mean to see God more often? I hear this often when I sit down in counseling sessions. I just am not feeling God. You ever been there? I just don't feel him right now. I feel like he's distant from me. It's like he's not talking to me. You ever feel that? Well, come on, don't let your pastor out on a limb. I, I see a lot of people like, I don't want to admit this in church. Right. We can admit this here, that we have seasons of dryness with God. And I want to give you some, some, maybe some pointers from this passage that will help you see and encounter God again or more frequently. Raise your, your chances of seeing and experiencing God in a more prominent way. Number one is commitment. If you see the women, they had bought spices. They were already invested. They were committed to the works of Christ. Even in death, they were still committed. By the way, do you know the disciples are running in fear at this time? But the women stayed committed. The men were hiding, and the women stayed committed in this moment. (laughs) That's, That's pretty amazing. But this idea of commitment of the women, they bought spices, they were committed to, to Jesus' life and his, even his burial. And this is where the Bible warns us, where your investment is, your heart will be also. Notice they're spending their money on somebody who's already passed away, and from everything they can tell, there's no sign that he's raising quite yet, but they're still invested. There's this this thing that they are committed to Christ and they get to see his working through that commitment. They get to be, by the way, the first to notice that the grave was empty. That's kind of an honor, huh? It comes via commitment. Commitment. Um, This is where uh, you've heard maybe the secular saying, if you aim at nothing, then that's what you will hit. If you aim at nothing, that's what you will hit. In your relationship with Christ, if you just think that, that you're just going to sit in your couch and do whatever you want, and somehow God is going to come and show you his glory, well, you're being a couch potato. You don't ever open your Bible. You never pray for somebody. You never go to church. You, you never sit in a small group. You never talk to Christians and confess your sins before one another, one another and pray for each other. And you sit there and you think God's just going to, with a booming voice, say, Hey, I've been waiting for you, couch potato. Sometimes God has already entrusted with us this expanding kingdom, the gospel. And when you want to see Jesus, that means all, just obeying the, the commands that he's already given you. And that means staying committed. Boy, we saw this played out big time. And I, I mentioned COVID a lot, but it was a culture changing event, wasn't it? And we saw that, that churches across the nation began to shed off all of these people because they were like, you know, church has really kind of become inconvenient now. Serving God has really kind of become inconvenient. And now post-COVID era, we've only got a, a certain percentage of those people who came back. I think you're finding out who was walking with Christ in anticipation like these women. Who were ready to see God move? And are we seeing God move? Yeah, big time. Big time, young people coming to faith. We've had revival. We've seen people responding to the gospel. We've seen younger generations light up and become awake. And so there's this sense that that we knew, and God knew this was going to come after COVID, but those who were sleeping stayed asleep and never came back. Commitment. This is where uh, Jesus tells us, Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Um, If you have a Bible, 
Matthew 6, 19 through 24 says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Treasures on earth. These women were already investing even in the death of Jesus. Where moth or rust destroy. Can I get an amen? Some of you just replace that with kids or teenagers and empty fridge cannot last, right? Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves. This is one of those few moments where the Bible seems to say, you can be a little selfish here if you're investing in the, if you're selfishly wanting the kingdom. I want you to hear this. But lay up for yourself treasures in where? Heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You ever seen this play out in somebody in your life where they uh, take a big amount of their wealth and they invest it in uh, the stock market or whatever, and they have that app on their phone? You know what I'm saying? Or they got it on their watch and they're like, you know, always looking, where's their attention going? To where their treasure is. To where their treasure is. By the way, your treasure by the, you don't, treasure on earth doesn't just have to be money, does it? It can be your toys, it can be your pastime, it can be your hobbies, where you spend a lot of time looking and focusing, where you spend a lot of time focusing and looking. But Jesus continues, the eye, what we look at, what we are committed to is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. This is not a medical diagnosis. You're not going to hear this from your doctor. (laughs) You're like, is my eye healthy? Well, then the rest of me must be healthy. No, he says your eye is healthy. Your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? What What is Jesus trying to warn us about? That you become like the things that you look at. You become like the things you look at. Now, many of you are like trying to think about what this means. Just look at high school kids. Have you ever look at high school kids? Have you ever noticed there's these groups that tend to dress like each other? They wear the same tennis shoes and have the same haircuts. Come on, I know you were all like this. I've seen some of the pictures with you in mullets, okay? Where did that come from? Okay. So there's this thing, we become like the culture that we're looking at. We become like the people that we're beholding, the people that we're committed to. We start to talk like them. I had a group of friends in high school, and I remember my mom pulling me aside. She says, Shane, you're starting to sound exactly like them. In tone, in the words that you use, you sound exactly like them. It's because I was very worried about what my friends were doing. And I was beholding them. I was committed to them. See, your eye is very important. What you focus on, what you commit to is what becomes you. That's kind of scary, isn't it? It's kind of interesting to start thinking in those terms. But Jesus here says, lay up for your treasure. Lay up where, where should your treasures be invested? In the kingdom of heaven, what does that do? It makes you look up. It makes you look up. It makes you look at Jesus, doesn't it? Makes you look at Jesus. So there's commitment there. There's commitment there. What if instead of picking uh, easy things, we took on big stones beyond our might? So when the women are walking up to the tomb, they're already thinking, oh my goodness, who's going to move the, the stone in front of us? It's beyond our ability. How many of you love to take on tasks that are beyond your ability? You're the first to sign up for VBS when you're like, I can't do kids. Right? We don't like to take on tasks that we may or may not fail at. Well, these women had already committed. They didn't know. They had bought spices, and they were already in. They were committed to Jesus, and they didn't even know if they could fulfill the task that they had set out to do. They just knew that they loved Jesus, and they were committed to him. Do you see the point there? But they show up, and there's this beautiful principle. When we take on huge tasks that are sometimes beyond us, what does God do? He shows up. He shows up and he shows us. 
what he's capable of. And he moves away that stone. It was very large, that reminiscent of a passage in Psalm 77, 14. I think I have that for you. Yeah, here it is, 77, 14. You are the God who works wonders. Do you believe that God works wonders? Do you anticipate those wonders? Or do you think, surely God will never do that in my life? You have made known, you have made known your might among the peoples. Boy, that sounds like Jesus on this day where, where the stone is rolled away. These women, they didn't know how they were going to accomplish this task of preparing Jesus. They show up, the stone is rolled away, but not only is the stone rolled away, they don't even have a task anymore because he had some other entirely amazing thing going on. That was rising from the dead. Isn't that cool? You ever start a small task? And it leads you to another task that you're like, whoa, I didn't know that was going on. Brothers and sisters, here's where I say, if you don't know what your gifting is in the church, just get started. And you know what? One thing may lead to another, may lead to another, and then God will show you. God will show you what it is to participate in the church with your gifting. Um one thing may lead to another. So commitment, there's a wonder there. They expected this stone to, uh, they didn't know how they would move it, but they expected that God would show up and he did. Number two, look up. Look up. This means being attentive to what God is doing. So many of us today, if we were the women in that day, we would be what we call navel gazing. We'd just be so depressed and we'd be looking down. We'd be looking down and downtrodden about how the world is today. And there's a real potential if you look on online today, everybody's looking at um, the Olympics and the intro ceremonies and how there was some kind of sketchy stuff on the, in the opening ceremonies. Okay, yes, the world is dark. Is that a surprise to us? Sin exists, yes. People are in open rebellion against God. That shouldn't be a shocker. But you know what? It fills me with great hope that, hey, now we know where the missions field is. We should be sending missionaries to France. Amen? Because there's the sense that we get so defeated and we walk around and just like, oh, man, the world is dark. And, and these women, they looked up. Be attentive to what God is doing. Don't get so bogged down in the day-to-day -day woes. I think I call this woe is me thinking. You ever been there? Woe is me thinking. I want you to, instead of woe is me thinking, the Bible's geared around this idea of worship that's built on thanksgiving. You know, the enemy of woe is me thinking is thanksgiving thinking, where you walk in thanks. I've been made right with the God of the universe. I get to live eternally with him. In fact, he's listening to me right now and loves me. Whew. I've been conferred the same love that God had for Jesus has been conferred to me. Look up. Look up. What if we were people who looked up at the truths of Scripture and we rejoiced a little bit more often? What if we lifted our hands and spun around? So we look up and we become like what we behold. Matthew 5, 12 says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I think it's interesting, so often in Scripture, that what's rejoicing is paired with what? Persecution and suffering. You ever tried to take those two principles in Scripture and squash them together and go, How do these work? rejoicing and suffering? How do I put these two pieces together? But so often the scriptures tell us, rejoice and be glad for your reward is in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Persecution and rejoicing? How could that be? I'll tell you how that can be. Someone who beholds Jesus, someone who beholds the workings of God, lifts their hands, and spins around. You ever seen a, ki a child or a kid just overwhelmed with joy? Overwhelmed with joy, just as I was to say, look at what I had done with my dad at that, that uh, school where everybody was like 
disturbed and uh, frightened for what I had in my hands. I was just overjoyed to share what I had experienced with my dad. Behold, um, so we become like we be what we behold. I think I, I nailed that point home, but I just want to give you a couple of examples of what you see. You ever notice Taylor Swift fans tend to look like Taylor Swift? You ever notice NASCAR fans tend to wear all of the NASCAR swag? You know what I'm saying? Um, I, for me, when I was a kid, I listened to angry music. My favorite band was Against All Authority when I was a punk rocker, and then I could never figure out why I was so angry all the time. Have you ever taken the, the uh, challenge, Positive Encouraging K-Love, on the radio where you listen to like 30 days of Positive Encouraging radio that's about Jesus, and you go, hmm, I feel better, and I can't figure out why. Maybe it's because you're becoming like what you're beholding. Maybe it becomes, you're becoming like what you behold. So let us be people who behold the resurrection and become resurrected, amen? That's that new life that we get in Jesus. So then the challenge for us, if we see, so if God is the show and he's showing us that he's conquered death, he's conquered sin on our behalf, what is it that we are to do? And his first challenge to the ladies via this um, young man, long white robe on the right side says, go and tell, go and tell, go and tell. Verse 7 See, and then he gives them this promise. If you look in the passage, he gives them this crazy promise. But go and tell his disciples, go and tell his disciples and Peter. I think it's interesting that he kind of excludes Peter and points him out specifically that he is going before you to Galilee. This is an amazing thing because this is basically the gospel, isn't it? Jesus has gone before you in the grave and conquered it. That's the gospel. That's what we tell. And so there's this beautiful promise, I think, over and over in Scripture that if you show up and you begin to tell, not only are the disciples going to see Jesus, but these women are going to see Jesus when they go and report. They're going to see more of Christ, aren't they? So there's this beautiful principle. Brothers and sisters, if you want to encounter Christ, go and tell. And he might meet you there because he's gone ahead of you. He's gone ahead of you, and we'll meet you in those conversations. How many of you have that one intimidating conversation with that one person? You know, you, you just you want to tell them about Jesus. You've been praying, but they are very antagonistic towards you. And they make you feel kind of ashamed for the conversation. And you're, you're praying, and you're just you're, you're so scared about that conversation. What if you prayed, God, would you meet me there? Would you meet me there? You've gone before me. Uh, I've said this before. I say, you send out Holy Spirit grenades. That's prayer. Let me translate. That just means prayer, where you're just praying. You ever sick the Holy Spirit on somebody? My wife used to do this uh, to me in our marriage. Um, there was something that she would want for me to improve on, and instead of confronting me because she knows I'm stubborn and I would just double down on my error, she would begin to pray for me. And it would take about a week, and I would be made very uncomfortable and I would go to my wife and I say, "Stop praying for me," because <laughs> she had sucked the she she um, got the Holy Spirit after me. Some of you should be doing that for people in your life. But God has gone before you in those conversations, especially if you send Him before you via the Holy Spirit in your prayer. There you will see Him, just as He told you. There is a blessing in making disciples. Church, I can't say this enough. The reason Jesus gives us the great commission to go make disciples is the hundredfold promise. When you go and make disciples and you invest in other people, you know what happens? You have a wealth of relationships and brothers and sisters that you never would have had before. People who love you and you love them and they fail you and you fail them and then you all build each other back up and you pray for each other. You see what I'm saying? There's a blessing in making disciples that I think the church misses because we're just terrified to go and make disciples, invest in others. But there's a beautiful blessing there. There's a beautiful blessing there. So the Great Commission, and it, this starts Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8.
Let me bring it up here. Acts 1 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. See, witnesses, I love the word witness. I love the word witness because it has a twofold meaning, doesn't it? A witness, if you're a witness to something, you have to both see it and experience it and then tell about it, and then tell about it. So many people are preaching. You ever heard, heard somebody preach or teach that isn't encountering God? You can tell pretty, pretty quickly, can't you? Somebody who's just teaching good things instead of teaching what they see the Father doing. There's two very different approaches there. We're not just handing out knowledge. We're pointing to a person. God. So when we become witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, by the way, there is a unique empowerment. Again, God shows up when we go. There's a unique empowerment. See, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you to do what? To witness. There's a unique empowerment by the Holy Spirit in witnessing. Have you missed that gift? Have you missed that blessing? I don't know. I I think many of us would look at those moments and have some regrets, yes. But you know what the cool thing is? God always meets us today because his mercies are new every morning, amen? And so if you're like, man, I feel distant from God, you know, this intimacy with God that we talked about a couple of weeks ago can start now, can start now. Second Peter first, uh, Second Peter 1, 12, therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. I think it's interesting that the, the message of he's gone before us, many of us maybe know the gospel, we know what Jesus has done, but we get bogged down and we forget the mission, don't we? I think it's interesting that you have then the um, particular reminder to Peter. Remember how he was uniquely, uh, the, the man in the white robe says, uh, go to the disciples and Peter. You ever been singled out? Poor Peter, he gets picked on all the time, right? I think it's interesting that he's so singled out, but here in this passage, you see that he was singled out for a reason. He was wallowing in hopelessness when the the Lord had been resurrected already. There was a, a, a moment or a point that he realized that reminders are important. Anybody set reminders on your phone? Anybody need a, a schedule? And if you don't have a schedule, you just go crazy. Well, here's this idea of remind you of these qualities. Remind yourself. See, Peter is also reminding his uh, viewer or his listeners in Second Peter, but he's he had to be reminded in a very important moment, didn't he? We don't ever graduate the gospel. Another interesting thing uh, about this is he, the first people he sends them to are the disciples to just be reminded. Um, It's been interesting for me when I share the gospel sometimes with a Christian or a fellow Christian, they get offended at me. You ever had this happen to you? Where you're like, I don't assume anybody I'm talking to is a believer unless I'm absolutely certain. So I just, my go-to is to share the gospel again by way of reminder. And you know how I know when somebody's at a good place in in their walk with Christ? If they hear the gospel again, they go, yes, thank you, not I'm already a Christian. I'm offended you didn't think I was. If somebody preaches the gospel to you, you're walking around a fairground or whatever, and there's a gospel tent, and somebody comes up to you and preaches the gospel, don't get upset with them. Say, amen, brother. Thank you for assuming I wasn't, because if I wasn't, I'd be so glad you shared the gospel with me. We remind that ministry of reminder. By the way, parents... Remind your kids until they're so sick and saturated of the gospel that that's all they hear from you. Uh, My my badge of honor is when my kids go, 
Dad, we've heard this one. I go, good. We're going to go over it again. By way of reminder, brothers and sisters, we need that reminder, don't we? Well, I'm, I'm at, at risk of going over the time, but I, wanted to, I want to show you a video. As I close, as I give you a challenge, I wanted to show you a video. We become like what we behold. Here is, here's a young man, and you just I want you to notice, I'm going to point this out in the video, how excited he gets to tell what he's seen, okay? To tell of what he's seen. Like he's learned while fishing, the incredible moment caught on camera, adding to the legend of this fish. When 10-year-old Kamari Cooper felt that bite, he set the hook and knew he had something special. Oh, he was good. And so did his fishing partner, his dad, who kept the camera rolling. Oh, my fish is fun. For the Coopers who live in Tallahassee, Florida, fishing is in their DNA. I just wanted to pass on this thing that my father taught me. He kept me out of trouble. And patience helped Kamari keep that fish on the line and take a look. A seven pound bass, Kamari's personal best. Even he can't believe it. Is this your personal best? Is this your personal best? Part of the story, what happened after the catch? Tomorrow, he's showing us all how much he's learned from his father. This is the end of the world. My personal best, I hope he's going to be the best. Oh, look at it, y'all. Oh, she's so beautiful. I hope he go back and be better. One day, he's going to be back again. That's right. That's right. You know, I was preparing that video for you guys, and I just started to kind of get worked up at this idea that no matter you have an earthly father or not, we all have a heavenly father who showed us victory over death. And did you see that kid's joy over a fish? I, I mean, I'm a fisherman. I love fish. But he got up, and he, did, he was just overcome with joy. There's this beautiful thing, guys. Our Lord is risen. He's risen and he invites us into resurrection. And with great joy, overwhelming joy, we get to say, look at what I've learned from my dad. Look at what my dad did for me. I believe when, when Christians finally understand that message, there's going to be revival. When we understand the preciousness of the treasure that we bear in that good gospel good news, there will be salvation like you cannot stop. Because we cannot help but share what we've beheld in Christ. Brothers and sisters, that's going to be my prayer for you. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here. God, I love them. Help us fall in love and behold your victory over death. That empty grave stands there as a symbol of joy for us that we now get to walk with you as sons and daughters. Lord, we just want to rejoice in that and share it to the mountaintops. Lord, we pray that now in Jesus' name. Amen.